Hello students, this is your Professor Dr. Mink, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 8, Arrays and More. You'll notice we're skipping Chapter 7 uh, because we only have so much time in this class, and uh, I believe that arrays are more important than multiple forms. They are a, uh, a programming structure that if you do any more programming uh, in your career or life, you will see again. So let's get started. Keeping with standard procedure, we will cover the first half of chapter eight in this lecture. 8.1, arrays, 8.2, array processing techniques. And then we'll get into procedures and functions that work with arrays. And last, we'll discuss multi-dimensional arrays, which are rather complex. Um, and uh, we will not be coding a multifunctional, multi-dimensional array. I can't even say it. Okay, <laughs> thanks. An array is a group of variables that are the same data type, and they are sequential in memory. They have a single name, which is the name of the array, and then an indexed value. One of the most important characteristics of elements of an array are that they are sequential in memory. You don't, at this point in time, you don't get to see that, but you should know that each of the, let's say we declare an array of ints, 10 int integers. They will be adjacent to each other in the computer's memory, which is very difficult to see if you're a computer science major and you take computer org, um, this concept of memory and adjacent memory locations will be um, become more apparent. And by the way, I'm the only professor at the college that teaches that 200 level course. So if you get there, we'll be talking about this again together. So a single dimension array is useful for storing and working with a single set of data. There are also multi-dimensional arrays to store and work with multiple sets of data. A two-dimensional array is actually an array of arrays. I know, I know, too much, too fast. Uh, I hesitated to even say that at this point, but just hang on and we'll clarify all of this. Loops are very useful in processing arrays. And we'll use a loop um, to sum and average all the elements in an array, sum all the columns in a two-dimensional array, and search an array for a specific value. We'll also just touch upon parallel arrays, but like I said, we'll get there. These are just introductory um, topics at this point in time. So, First, we're going to cover the, co the content from chapter 8.1, which is basic array characteristics, declaring an array, filling an array, initializing an array, etc. So let's get started. First, let's discuss the characteristics of an array. As I mentioned briefly in an earlier slide, an array stores multiple values, sequential in memory, that are of the same data type. So there are a group of variables stored with a single name, okay? You know, for example, the days of the week might be a set of seven string variables stored in an array called days of week, okay? So all the variables within an array are called elements and must be of the same data type. So how do you access the elements in an array you're asking, I know you are, you use a subscript. And it is a zero-based numbering system, which means the first element in the array is the array name sub zero. We'll get to that next, just hang on. The subscript, also called an index number, identifies the specific element within an array. And subscript numbering works like a list box index. As you probably guessed, it begins with zero. 
So the first element in an array is always subscript zero. The last element is the total number of elements minus one. So an array with seven elements refers to the first element as zero and the last element as seven minus one or six. Next, we're going to learn how to declare an array. You declare an array similarly to a regular variable, except for its upper subscript value. So in this case, we use the dim keyword. We give the array a name. In this case, array name is the name of the array. How creative. Upper subscript is the value of the array's highest subscript. It has to be a positive integer, okay? Or a positive integer named constant. You can't use a variable um, because once it's declared, it can't, this cannot change, okay? And data type is a visual basic data type. So if we're declaring it as a decimal, an int, wool, a cow, or whatever, we, we understand or we've already covered what those data types are. Here we have a coded example of an array declaration. We're declaring an array. Its name is int hours. And its highest subscript is six, which means it will hold seven integers, oh, by the way, as integer. It's, um, so this is an array of seven integers. It will hold integer hours zero through int hours six. And you can see in the diagram, it shows the locations. And, and yes, I'm gonna remind you what, what I told you earlier, these seven integers are adjacent or sequential in the computer's memory. All elements of an integer array are initialized to zero. Um, so, if you just declare an integer array, like we did in the previous uh, example, you're going to get seven sequential declared memory locations for integers, but they will have zero. Decimal elements are, initial to, are initialized to zero. String elements are initialized to the special value nothing, empty, if you will. You can also initialize the elements of an array during the declaration. So here is a coded example, similar to the previous example we covered, where we simply declared an array in numbers. In this example, we don't have to give the, um, the largest index number because it's implicit. So here we declare using dim, int numbers as an integer, and we assign int numbers in this format, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. So the upper, upper subscript, which is implied in this example because we're initializing five variables. So the result is an element, a six element array. You can use a named constant, but not a variable that can change. It has to be a constant as the highest subscript instead of a hard coded number. This is common especially um, if the highest subscript is used multiple times. And if the highest subscript for this application changes, you change the constant once, and then the size of the array declared throughout the program changes. I wanna caution you, you cannot use a regular variable name, such as an integer. It will not work because you cannot change that at runtime. It has to be a constant or a hard-coded integer value. At this point in time, 
you may be wondering how you access the individual elements in an array. Well, you can store a value in any of the array elements using an assignment statement with the index number. So in this case, we have six different assignment statements, int numbers zero, there's your subscript or your index number is being assigned a value 100. And then index one is being assigned the value 200, two, 300, three, 400, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the diagram at the bottom of this slide, you see the result. You see the actual sequential adjacent memory locations that have now been assigned a value 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. I briefly mentioned earlier in this lecture that loops are used frequently to process arrays. And the for loop is very useful. So in this particular coded example, we use a for loop with an integer counter set to zero to int max subscript. And int max subscript is the largest subscript for the declared string names array. <clears throat> so in this particular example, we're setting each of the string names zero to int max subscript, which in this case is 999. We're setting them all to empty. So this small amount of code, one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code actually sets the value for a thousand values or a thousand elements within the string names array. One of the common errors associated with array usage is a subscript specified outside the range of valid subscripts for that array. So for example, in the, in the array on the previous slide, if we try to assign a value to subscript 1001 or 1000, we would be trying to write a value in memory outside of the memory allocated for that string. So, and this is not, this is not checked at design time. So you could code that example incorrectly and it wouldn't give you a squiggly line or some sort of syntactical error. Visual Basic, uh, the runtime system perfor performs array bound checking during runtime. And so an invalid subscript will throw a runtime exception. And uh, here is an example of a runtime exception being shown, okay? The index out of range exception was not handled. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you have to be aware of the valid range of indexes that can be used within an array. And if you write beyond the highest index declared in the array, you have the potential of corrupting memory. In tutorial 8-1, we create an application that randomly generates lottery numbers that are stored in an array. And here, I'm going to post a, a video of 8-1 running and some brief um, explanations of what's happening within the code. But here's a block of code it's the event handler for the generate numbers button. We declare a constant integer called int max subscript, and we assign the value of four to it. Now, because it's declared as a constant, we can use it as the max subscript. So we're declaring an array, int numbers, int max subscript is going to be four, as integer. And so then we declare an int counter, int count as an integer. 
and we declare a random number, rand. So <clears throat> here's the for loop used to fill the, um, the array. And the array, because it has an int max of five, four, will hold five, zero, one, two, three, and four. So for int count equals zero, to int max subscript, which in this particular case is four. First time through the loop, int numbers, int count will be equal to zero. So int numbers sub zero will equal rand next 100. And then we'll go through the loop again. Int count will equal one. So int number sub one will equal the next random number between zero and 100, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, stop this tutorial right now. I'm sorry, stop this lecture right now and go to the video <clears throat> for tutorial 8.1, and you'll see the application running. And you'll see the five numbers displayed. You can also solicit data from the user and store it in an array. And I'm going to ask you, I'm, actually, I'm going to assign you <laughs> tutorial 8-2, which is an application that uses input boxes to read a sequence of strings as input and stores those strings in an array. And here's... Um, a little bit of a hint for that particular project, but that is assigned this week, and therefore I'm not going to post a video of it running. Okay. Arrays have a property called length, and the length property is one greater than the upper subscript, which can cause students problems in um, stepping through an array and writing to or trying to read from an invalid subscript. <coughs> so <coughs> please be conscious that the length is one greater than the upper subscript. So here is an example of uh, use of the length property. So we declare um, an array string names and we're going to initialize it with three values, which will set the upper subscript value. So then we're going to step through with a for loop for int count equals zero, because we know the first element index is always zero, to string names dot length minus one. In this case, the length of string names is going to be three, okay? but the upper subscript is going to be two. Do you see the problem? So if you were to step through int count equals zero to string names dot length, you would get an index value out of an invalid index value. So message box dot show string names int count. So this will display in a message box each of the values, in this particular case, strings stored in index location zero, one, and two. Please know that <clears throat> elements in the array can be used just like regular variables in operation. So, for example, in the int hours array, which stores an array or a series of ints, we can use any of the elements or indexed values just like we could use a regular int. So here's an example. Des gross pay equals int hours sub three. Okay, that's the... <clears throat> In this particular case, that's the fourth index location in int hours, zero being the first, one being the second, two being the third, three being the fourth, times decimal pay rate. So whatever value is, whatever integer value is stored in int hours sub three, the fourth index location, will be multiplied by decimal rate and stored in decimal gross pay. We could also do things like int tallies sub zero plus equals one. That will increment 
the value stored at the index location zero, the first index location, it will index, I'm sorry, increment that value by one. Okay. Um, tutorial 8-3, which I'll demonstrate in a video, shows you a complete application that performs calculations using the elements in an array. So now would be a good time, you know the routine, to stop, pause this video lecture and go take a look at the tutorial 8-3 video I have posted in the timeline. Next, we're going to see how we can access array elements with a for each loop. The for each loop um, simplifies array processing. It retrieves the value of each element, but it cannot modify the values. And here we have in the um, rectangular box, the general format of the for each loop. Var is the name of the variable just for the use with the loop. Type is the data type of the array and array is the name of an array. Let's take a closer look. So here we have an array declared and initialized with the values 10. It's an integer array. The values 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So we can use the for each loop, display all the values in a list box. And the lower rectangular box shows you the code. So for each int value as integer, in array, int array list show dot items dot add int val next and that will display each of the values in the list box named list show um, the for each loop can also be used to process items in a collection so for example in the items collection of a list box in this example, we have a list box named list cities, and we're using the for each to find a specific city. And that city is um, going to be from the input box. In, this, in the example, the diagram example, the user types in Miami and then chooses find a city. So the for each loop then steps through each of the elements in that uh, each of the items in that collection of the list box and if it finds a match then it displays the label message the city was found in most cases you store values in an array for later processing so for example if there are test scores uh, for specific students then you want obviously to average total average sum etc so in section 8.2 we're going to focus on um, techniques for processing arrays often you want to sum all the values in a numeric array and for this type of processing, we use a loop and an accumulator variable, a variable that starts out uh, with zero. And each time we step through the array, we add the, the current element being inspected or visited, if you will, to the accumulator variable. And this is used, this is most often done with a for next loop. So let's step through this coded example on this slide. We declare a constant for the maximum subscript. We set it to 24. And we declare an array called int units. And int max subscript is used um, to specify 24 as its maximum subscript. So there we're declaring int total. That's our accumulator variable. It's an integer and we have to initialize it as zero because the first time we use it, we're going to try and add a value to it. And if it's not yet been initialized, we'll get a runtime error. And we're gonna set a counter. We're gonna declare a counter called int count. Then we go into the for loop for int count equals zero, okay, to int units length minus one, right? Because 
the length minus 1 will give us the highest index location. So int total plus equals int units int count. So let's walk through this step by step. The first time through the loop, our counter is 0. Int totals, I'm sorry, int total equals 0. So int total, 0, plus equals means add what's ever on the right of that to int total. That's the equivalent of int total equals int total plus int units sub int count. So int total, which equals 0, is we're adding to that int units int count. So we're adding to that the value stored in index 0, because int count starts at 0. Then the for loop will increase int count to 1, and then we will add int units sub 1, the value stored at index location 1, the second integer stored in this integer array, to int total. And we will continue to step through until we get to length minus 1. This array's length is 25. Its maximum subscript is 24. But remember, it stores values at 0 through 24. So we're going to stop at index location 24, which is the maximum subscript location. And at the end of this for loop, int total will contain the sum of all values stored in the int units array. In the example we just discussed, you can substitute the for loop with a for each loop along with an accumulator. And the code is exactly the same except for we're using for each where we used for. Another calculation that's commonly performed with arrays and items stored in arrays is to calculate the average value stored in that numeric array. So what you do is you sum the values in the array, which we just covered, and then after that loop ends, you need to divide the sum by the number of elements. So the addition to sum is at the bottom of the rectangular coded section, double average equals int total divided by int units dot length. Remember, length holds the total number of values stored in the array. You would it, it would not be appropriate or would not be correct to use int max subscript because in that case that's 24. But remember, we started at zero, and this array held 25 elements. So obviously, you calculate your sum, which we saw in the previous two slides, and then you divide it by the, um, the array's length property and assign that to a double. In this particular case, it's called double average. One of the common processes performed on values stored in an array are locating or finding the highest and or lowest value stored in that array. Let's go through highest first, lowest is very similar. Um, so in this particular case, we declare our array, it's called int units, and we initialize it to one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, four, and five, very complex numbers. <laughs> then we declare our counter, it's called int count, that's an integer, and we declare a variable to hold the highest value, int highest, Obviously, that's an integer also. First thing we knew we need to do before we go into the for loop is set in highest to some value. So we're going to assume in highest equals in units sub zero, the first value. Don't worry, this will change. So we're going to put one in in highest. Then we go into a for loop that will search for the highest value. For int count equals one to int units dot length minus one, right? That will give us the highest index location. Okay, if int units sub int count, we're going to start at one, because we've already got int highest as zero. Greater than int highest, 
then int highest equals the current index being, being inspected. So let's go through this. Int highest is assigned int units sub zero, which is one. If int units sub one, which is two, is greater than one, that's true, then in highest is assigned two. We go back up, then we look if int units, what, sub two, which is three, is greater than the value two, which it is, then we swap them. This will continue to swap every value because they're ascending until it gets to the last index location five, and that will be assigned to int highest. When we finish this loop, when this loop terminates, int highest will hold the highest value in the array, which in this case is five. So here we have the code to find the lowest. And it is very similar, except we set int lowest to int units of zero. And then we go through the count from one to int units dot length minus one. And we ask if the current int units sub int count is less than int lowest, then we swap them, or then we assign the current value, index value being inspected to int lowest. So in this particular case, it will never swap because we're going to start with the lowest one. We're going to compare two to one, not swap them, three to one, not swap them, four to one, not swap them, five to one, not swap them. I hope this was helpful. Next, we're going to look at how to copy one array's contents to another. Here's a single assignment statement, and let's assume int new values and int old values are two arrays. This will not copy array values from in old values into the um, uh, comparable index locations in int new values. It simply causes both array names to reference the same array in memory, which is not probably not we want it, not what we want it. You must use a loop to copy individual elements from one array to another. So in this case, we use a for loop. For int count equals zero to int old values dot length minus one, right? To get the highest index location. And then we say int new values int count, which will start at zero, equals int old values int count, which will start at zero, and go to one, the two. So this will copy index location values zero to zero from old values sub zero to new values sub zero. 1 to 1, 2 to 2, et cetera, et cetera, until it gets to the highest index location. Next, we talk about parallel arrays, which are arrays with the same size that have related data. Um, the most common example I can think of is an array that includes the 12 month names as strings, and then a second parallel array that includes 12 integers that correspond to the um, maximum number of days in that particular month, 31 for January, 28 for February, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that example is used in tutorial 8-4, and I'll display, I'm sorry, I'll create, or I've created a video for 8-4 showing the use of parallel arrays and how using the same index number, you can process two parallel arrays using the same loop. Uh, this would be a good time for you to stop this audio lecture and take a look at the video for 8-4. You can also have a parallel relationship between arrays, list boxes, and combo boxes. Okay, here's an example of a list box with names um, Gene, James, Kevin, Smith, Joe Harrison would correspond to index 0, 1, and 2, and then an array with the corresponding phone numbers for those individuals, okay? Element 0, phone numbers sub 0 would 
hold that phone number 55 it's a string actually 555-2987 phone number sub 1 would hold that phone number phone number sub 2 and they would correspond with index 0 1 and 2 in the list box so to display the phone number for a selected person's name you have the if list people dot selected index greater than or equal zero and list people dot selected index less than phone numbers dot length then you display that message box phone numbers list people dot selected index Arrays can also be used when you need to look up information in another array that has its data in a different order. So to do this, to match up the data in two arrays, we create what's called a third location array that tells us where the data referenced in one array is, is associated to other data in a second array. In this particular example, we have an array called string workshops, and the names of the workshops are stored in that array as strings. And then we have the cost of these workshops, and then we have the cities declared, and not necessarily in the same order. So negotiation skills wouldn't necessarily be $500 and held in Chicago. So in the next slide, we'll, we'll give you more information about how this is used to link two or information elements into arrays that are not in the same order. This is a continuation of the previous slide, arrays that point to other data. So we have a coded loop for i as integer starts at zero to string workshop dot length minus one which will get us the highest index location. And then we're going to use a list box, list, list show dot items dot add string workshops sub i, and then concatenate it with the string space will cost, concatenate with decimal cost i, and concatenate it with the string and will be held in string cities int locations i. And int locations is the array used to specify where that particular um, that particular workshop will be held. So int locations sub zero contains the value three. Three is used as the subscript for string cities. So the element in string cities three is Denver. So the first workshop, right, stored in string string workshop zero is actually pointing to the fourth element or string cities sub three through the use of int locations. I hope this was helpful. Another common task performed with arrays is searching those arrays to find a specific value. And as you probably guessed, loops are used for this and the most common method is what's called the sequential search which uses a loop to examine every one of the elements in the array it compares each of the elements with the value being searched for and it stops when the value is found or the end of the array is reached so here's some pseudocode for the sequential search you set found false subscript zero do while found is false and subscript is less than the array length. If the array subscript equals the search value, then we set found to true and we notice or we, we take the subscript that we're currently inspecting and we hold it in position. So then we have, we found the, the location via the subscript and we, we stop the loop. Another task frequently performed on values stored in an array is sorting those values in either ascending or descending 
ascending mean means the lowest numeric value to the highest. Uh, in other words, putting the lowest value in index of zero and the highest in the highest index location versus descending, which would put the highest value in index of zero and the lowest value in the highest index location specified in the declaration of the array. So for this, okay, we have a method, array.sort. And array.sort just simply takes the array name as the um, as the argument passed. And after this um, code in the lower right hand rectangular box is um, processed, the array in numbers, which starts off with 7, 12, 1, 6, 3 in index location 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, will have negative 1. I'm sorry, that's not a negative. 1, 3, 6, 7, and 12 in index locations 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Array.sort sorts in ascending order, meaning the smallest to the largest. And if you wanted a descending, you need to use the array.reverse method and pass the array as the argument. It's really that simple. And here is a coded example of sorting the numbers in descending, first ascending, and then reversing them to descending order. When you pass an array of strings to array sort, it's um, assorted in ascending order, and it uses the Unicode encoding scheme. And that uses a series of uh, priorities, if you will. Numeric digits first uppercase letters are second and lowercase letters third. So we'll compare the first character of each string. And if that's exactly the same, then it'll go to the second character and use the same scheme. So in the example, a coded example here, where we have a lowercase d-a-n, capital k-i-m, capital a-d-a-m, and capital b-i-l-l, -L, Adam, uppercase a will be first, B, I'm sorry, Bill, uppercase B will be second. Kim, because uppercase K is a higher priority than a lowercase D. If that were an uppercase D, Dan would be third and Kim would be fourth. But that's not the case because of the Unicode numbering system. I mentioned earlier that the size of the array must be determined at design time and it must be used you must be determined or declared with a constant variable or a hard-coded integer value well there is a way to dynamically size arrays at runtime using the redim statement and we're really pushing up against the boundary or the upper edge of um, this course. And I, I actually struggled with whether or not to include this or just delete this content, but it is in the textbook, so um, in chapter eight, so I will cover it. But it's a rather complex um, topic. So we can change the number of elements in an array at runtime using the redim statement. And here's the syntax for redim. There is an optional preserve keyword, the array name, and the new upper subscript number. If preserve is included, the existing values in the array are preserved. If not, all the existing values are destroyed and the array is redeclared um, or resized, if you will. Okay, an upper subscript becomes the new upper subscript number. It must be a positive whole number. If smaller than it was, elements at the end of the array are lost. Even if you use preserve, if you resize an array to a smaller size and you had tried or you're trying to preserve 
values in the array, the ones at the end will be lost. So please know that. Even preserve does not preserve values if you try to reallocate or resize the array to a smaller number of indexed elements. Here's a coded example of uh, dynamically resizing an array. In this example, we declare an array as a double with no size. Then we prompt the user for the number of elements and resize the array based on user input during runtime. So understand this first dim double scores as double is done during design time. And when it's compiled, it has a size of zero. So in this particular case, size of one actually, and it'll have an index value of zero. But in this particular case, we're going to then during runtime, prompt the user for the number of test scores to be stored in the, in the array. And if that value is greater than zero, we'll use the redim double scores and we will redeclare its largest index number as in number of scores minus one. Uh, I think this is the last topic we're going to cover in the first lecture for chapter eight. So thank you very much for watching. Obviously, if you have any questions about any of the content covered in this audio lecture, please, you know how to reach me. I'd prefer that you were um, asking these questions in the general questions and answer form, although I am taking questions from students via the mail function. Okay, thanks for watching. Have a great day.